We are wild and young. We. Ha Hello there, I'm Adam, hailing from Parts of Unknown, and this is how Adam would book this month. We are N X T. On February 23rd, 2010, the first episode of NXT launched on Sci Fi in the same slot that WWE ECW had occupied just the week before, and which Vince had cancelled with a near sexual amount of relish. And you know what? I know what we all remember, but for like a month, that version of NXT was a pretty good show. Sure, it paired Daniel Bryan as a rookie with his mentor. The Miz, but that was a move specifically designed to A, annoy the internet, and fair enough, good prank, but also it was designed to get Daniel Bryan over, and it worked. Like, he's the focus of the show for ages. On episode one, he has a really good match against world champion Chris Jericho, and the show just continues like that. Matches, angles, the Brian Miz story is the sort of foundation of everything. It's good episodic storytelling, getting over new talent by having them interact with established names, well-produced video packages that could have come straight out of the CWC. They keep an eye on everyone's win-loss records. It was good stuff for the first six weeks. But then, Oh no. But look, this intro is going to be a bit longer than usual because we've got a lot of history to cover, a lot of context to set up. And before we get into the really bad times of NXT, I want to take a quick moment to talk about our sponsor for this episode, Surfshark. And let's see how many NXT puns and references I can cram into 90 seconds. Does region locked content drive you developmental? Does the prospect of unsecure public networks leave you living in fear of a virus? takeover? Are you champering at the bit for a company to provide the way to oversee streaming content? Then let me spill the NXT about Surfshark VPN, a Kaylee ray of hope in these stark times that allows you to safely and securely access servers from over 60 countries with end-to-end -end encryption so you can keep your shirai on the content you love without worrying about being done by malicious software. Use Surfshark to safely encrypt your connection at a bar while you're out on an air LA night, or if you live outside the UK but want to watch UK Netflix in order to watch Tom Hanks go to the moon in Apollo 13, then we urge you to Kashida downloading Surfshark VPN today. But if Monet is an issue, go to surfshark.deals forward slash jam that jam. Use promo code jam that jam for 83% off and three months for free. Again, that's surfshark.deals forward slash jam that jam. Use promo code jam that jam for 83% off and three months for NX free. So yeah, for a while, NXT actually seemed like it could be a slow burn bit of quality programming, and then came the keg carrying challenge. And so piece by piece, NXT was turned into basically Quizzlemania. Genuinely, by later seasons of the show, they were actually playing games that have actually featured on Quizzlemania, like the match game or just a straight up trivia round. There was the talk about random bull for a bit round, the rock'em sock'em rookies round, the selling merch to fans round. It became a show where the rookies inexperience was a source of humor, not excitement. And look, says WWE, we're having fun with our pets, dressing them up in silly hats. And that's funny because they're not people like us. Also, look everyone, it's Johnny Gargano's first NXT appearance. Little different from 2018, huh? There were five seasons of NXT. Season two slid worse into comedy. By season three, Michael Cole was actively sabotaging the show with a huge fucking gong. It became the Cole heel turn platform. He would dance like a fucking moron, dump on the show and the contestants. In 2011, the game show elements were slowly, very slowly trimmed out, but the show was still underserved by an overtly goofy tone and also being filmed in f***ing arenas full of fans who did not care about these new upstarts. But then, on June 20th, 2012, NXT moved to a permanent residency in Full Sail University. Gone was the vast, untamable apathy of a local crowd just waiting for SmackDown to start. Here was a venue and crowd specifically curated for the show. So it became OVW or FCW, but with production quality and introduced by Jim Ross and Dusty Rhodes. The first episode showcased characters like Bray Wyatt, Damian Sandow, The Ascension, Seth Rollins, 
Bo Dallas. Over the years, simple, consistent booking with a strong initial focus on a championship rather than reality show artificial stakes in front of a regular audience, familiarity fostered genuine insider affection and people got over. For the next few years, WWE responded to the burgeoning internet presence of promotions like Ring of Honor in New Japan, who were going through their golden years, by drip feeding insanely talented wrestlers into NXT and slowly but surely the work rate quality increased and the loyal fans responded in kind. The journey of Sami Zayn in 2014, the advent of takeovers in 2014. In 2015, NXT truly exploded under the championship reigns of Zayn, Kevin Owens, Finn Balor. They began packing out arenas purely on their own name for TakeOver Brooklyn. Classics like Sasha Banks versus Bayley. NXT became reliable. And that's the key term here. It takes a long ass while for a wrestling promotion to become hot. It takes years of investment. But when you do have that reputation for reliability and the fans can trust you and where you're going week on week, they lean in and will offer in return patience, investment for storytelling. They will allow themselves to get hyped over things you want them to be hyped about. The brand kept rolling as a beacon of quality. Eras helmed and defined by their figureheads, hot stars who came in, worked their way up to NXT Championship status, they packed out arenas and then they left for the main roster. Finn Balor, Kevin Owens, the Horsewomen in 2015, Nakamura, Bailey, and Rude in 2016, DIY, The Revival, and The Undisputed Era in 2017, Alistair Black, Shayna Baszler, Gargano, Champer in 2018, the promotion's best year, Cole, Balor, Ripley, Lee, Shirai, Pete Dunne, Karrion Cross before before this f***ing thing. The weekly product moved to the USA Network in 2019, expanding to two hours to go live up against AEW Dynamite. The Wednesday Night Wars began, lasted 75 weeks, during which in the key demo of 18 to 49, AEW beat NXT 74 times out of 75. The product itself really started to stumble in the pandemic. Goofiness started to creep back in with the Robert Stone brand, Robert Stone throwing chunks in the ring, takeover in your house. But even with that kind of elevated sense of humor, the takeover still delivered like gangbusters. In April 2021, NXT moved to Tuesday, essentially admitting defeat in the Wednesday Night Wars. And in August, in no small part because of that defeat. And just as a side note, who the f cares about the Wednesday Night Wars? Like, do, do, who watches TV like that anymore? NXT, the reports would say, would be revamped in a major way, going back to a more developmental feel. The day before the debut episode of NXT 2.0, Samoa Joe relinquished the NXT Championship in circumstances that I can only describe as suspicious. I don't want to speak uninformed. I'm going to assume the injury is real and wish Joe a speedy recovery. It just seems odd that someone with the body type that Vince is famously not a fan of, having a undisclosed injury accrued at an undisclosed time, drops the belt just in time to turbocharge the appeal of an episode of NXT designed to reboot the entire brand. Whatever happens sucks for Samoa Joe. So September 14th, 2021 was a showcase of new NXT. And the most obvious change was the branding. Gone was the understated black and gold and in was... <laughs> oh, whoa. it is a really quite nauseating color palette that can best be described as unicorn diarrhea or NXT collodion. Combined with the bright studio lighting, I'm very surprised that no one showed up to accept an award and get gunged. And look, just to be clear, color in itself isn't a bad thing, although it's very clear that wrestling's favorite color is black. NXT has been dark, moody, thoughtful for a long time. That's personally how I enjoy my wrestling, but exuberance isn't by itself terrible. I don't think it's necessarily cool, and along with general reliability, that's sort of been NXT's biggest asset. The fact that as far as wrestling goes, it's cool. I don't know, in old NXT, people seem more dangerous. The matches were more awe-inspiring and the comedy was slightly better. And NXT 2.0, like, it wasn't a terrible episode. There was some good wrestling, a focus on newer talents, Jensen and Briggs, B-Fab, gosh, aren't hit row brilliant by the way, Carmelo Hayes and his new slightly less good at promos friend, the Creed Brothers, Von 
Von... Von Wagner. This is not in itself a bad thing, but it's a bit too big f off red flags in two very revealing booking decisions. First, a character almost directly out of the new generation era. Remember, WWE's best era, replete with colorful Steiner singlet. He is Rick Steiner's actual human son, after all. Manic, inhuman, mojo, rawly excitement, and the straight out of the comics alliterative name of Bron Breaker. He defeated established NXT talent LA Knight, despite Knight also being booked for an NXT title match later that night. It was a head-scratching bit of booking that reeked of main roster. Oh, it doesn't matter. No one really cares. We'll showcase who we want. Inconsistency that has made the main roster unreliable. It made zero sense for LA Knight as a shrewd heel character to, first of all, book his own match live on the show and jeopardize his chances for the championship by maybe getting hurt in that match. It undermined his character and the importance of the title match later in the show. And that was followed up by another weird bit of booking later in the night. Kyle O'Reilly being advertised for the NXT championship match only to be removed at the last minute and replaced with Von Wagner, someone I'm sure is very talented, but who no one knows or currently cares about. There's genuine December to dismember vibes coming off that. Vince replacing Sabu with Hardcore Holly on a whim on the night. Sorry about what we advertise, because again, uh, it doesn't matter. No one really cares. We'll showcase who we like. Also, a two-on-two -two tag match became a six-person tag after interference. Player. Also, the advertised match of Frankie Monet versus Raquel Gonzalez just didn't happen. These are warning signs. And yes, look, it, these are potentially big assumptions to make big overreactions. Under any other circumstances, they would be big overreactions, but with all eyes on NXT's new creative process and Vince properly being involved now, these are comparisons to main roster bad habits that NXT really don't need if they want to maintain their loyal fan base's trust and willingness to engage in sillier concepts like for example, wrestling weddings. And indeed, wrestling weddings main eventing the show over the crowning of Tommaso Ciampa as new NXT champion. Fun fact, in the bad goofy days of NXT, there was not one, but two wrestling weddings on the show. Now look, I like the index stuff. I, and I like the wedding, but it's a gr grim f***ing omen, huh? For the longest time, stars came into NXT with a sense of already having earned their top spot via their tenure on the indies, while the mid-card saw more homegrown talent slowly flourish. Von Wagner being crowbarred into a title match because Vince sees him as a future Mania main eventer, that is a very different vibe from the NXT we're used to. I hope NXT 2.0 is great. There's still more than enough talent on their books in NXT for it to be great, although you know, not nearly as much talent as they used to be since WWE started purging its roster in earnest earlier this year. NXT 2.0 was a thinner, lighter show with less remarkable matches that focused on new names. And that's fine. That's what it was in June 2012. But also this is nine years later and I'm not entirely sure why we're going backwards. And also this version of NXT looks like the M&M store. I am worried. And with all eyes, currently on NXT's big colorful reboot. And after a very long introduction, let me have a go. So the whole point of this booking, and it's something that 90% of people watching this video, and probably the guy hosting it, will fundamentally disagree with, is the concept that NXT needs to change. There needs to be an NXT 2.0. I, I cannot just say don't. I, I can't say just do the old NXT things of having young homegrown stars mixing up with indie darlings with satisfying long main events every week and intense well-produced character video packages and stakes focused drama. Like that's NXT 1.0 apparently. Can't do that. Something needs to change and I just What's the, what's the point? Why are they doing it? I don't know why they're doing it. I really, I don't, it was fine. <laughs> it was the best bit. And it's not to say there weren't problems with NXT 1.0, not so much in its glory years of 2014 to 2015 and all of 2018. Like for me, those years, it was just a perfect wrestling television show. An hour a week, 
An hour a week, silly characters, but delivered earnestly with consistent internal logic, starting with dream match concepts, working backwards from there. When the Wednesday Night Wars happened, we had an NXT that felt scrappier, more loose in terms of booking. But then again, constant, unpredictable talent raids will do that to a brand. But in the pandemic, yeah, admittedly, it lost a lot of its shine. But NXT is incredibly crowd dependent without a crowd to feed off. Nuance, especially in terms of its comedy. And don't forget, NXT's always been silly in some way. You know, Sandow, Ascension, Breeze, Bailey, Alistair Black was a bit silly. The nuance gave way to wackier hijinks because uh, n we cut, no one's here. Our loyal fans are not here. How do we know we're being funny? Just everyone ramp it up, stare down the lens, cross your eyes. Robert Stone, get in here. Robert Stone, get in here. You could argue that the roster got a bit too bloated for its own good in the later years. The matches got a bit too false finishy so that you know, if any of the big names that were on the books ever lost, you know, people would worry if they were being misused. Mid-card talent maybe felt like they had ceilings over them. I, I don't know how much of this I agree with. But look, NXT refocusing itself as a developmental brand, that's a good idea and one that we would care less about. If Raw and SmackDown, SmackDown to a lesser extent, we're just better. Get them better. That is the main issue here. So we're starting with Stand and Deliver. Karrion Cross makes a huge statement defeating the current top guys in NXT in the Fatal Five Way and crucially Karrion Cross does not then debut on Raw without Scarlett and lose to Jeff F***ing Hardy looking like a frog before Cross then looks like the world's saddest skinhead at a cancelled Dropkick Murphys concert before then going on to look like someone going to a Ninja Turtles LARP dressed as a sex dungeon cheese grater. This doesn't happen. Instead, Karen Cross stays in NXT, irate at management's attempts to wrestle the title off him to stem his wave of destruction. You know, not the wisecracking in a suit Karen Cross, the Karen Cross that first debuted, cutting intense promos backstage, surrounded by the corpses of NXT trainers that he just torn limb from limb. Cross is in the ring with William Regal. Regal's out there with security, threatening to have Cross indefinitely suspended and stripped of the title if he doesn't stop these shenanigans when Cross attacks. He lays out William Regal with his elbow to the back of the neck, to the neck that William Regal's had surgery on. And William Regal is trolleyed away by medical staff. William Regal is gone from NXT permanently. Cross has single-handedly killed the William Regal era, which is the longest running GM ship, I think, in WWE history. He declares NXT his wasteland and Scarlet signals the coming apocalypse. Everyone and everything will fall and pray. Cross has gone fully out his tree. He is absolutely Banjo-Kazooie. He is 100p out to lunch. NXT falls into chaos. With Regal gone, there's no one to keep order. Stars start making their own matches. Drake Maverick challenges Isaiah Swerve Scott to a match for the North American Championship, beats him with a roll-up, but because the match wasn't officially sanctioned by an NXT GM, Scott just decides he's gonna keep the title, has Hit Row decimate Maverick. No one knows what is going on? It becomes a long-running joke that people keep coming to try and take control of NXT and are killed by carrying cross like a Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher. Everyone falls and prays. In the end, who can step in to save NXT in its darkest hour? Triple H walks down to the ring to confront Karrion Cross. This is his baby. He will not allow Vincent, sorry, Karrion Cross to destroy everything he spent almost 10 years of his life building. This leads to NXT TakeOver 36, Karrion Cross versus Triple H, loser leaves NXT. Despite super kick interference from Shawn Michaels, who I assume will have dressed up for the occasion by wearing only his fanciest straw cowboy hat, Cross wins. He beats Triple H in Triple H's only TakeOver match and essentially banishes the godfather of NXT from his own brand. With Triple H gone, Shawn Michaels is the only one left. The next NXT cross stands in the ring. He's beaten Balor, Ciampa, Gargano, 
Triple H, he is ready to rule over NXT like the Shao Kahn that he is. He's gonna initiate martial law. Shawn Michaels walks out, cross goes him. What are you gonna do about it? Are you going to step into the ring with me? Michael says that no. He hung up his cowboy boots 10 years ago because Crown Jewel 2018 never existed. But Michaels does have one last bullet in the chamber. He's joined on stage by Samoa Joe, Seth Rollins, Kevin Owens, Shinsuke Nakamura, and Drew McIntyre. He's Avengers assembled some of the greatest NXT champions from NXT's past in order to finally wrestle the belt and control of NXT back from Cross. This leads to a special episode of NXT, let's just call it NXT Endgame, come up with a legally distinct title yourself. The past NXT champions brought back in to stop Cross a six pack, falls count anywhere, mega match. All these historic champions, a one night only crisis on infinite NXTs. NXT must be saved. Something must be done. NXT Endgame opens with the Index Wedding because yes, it is goofy. Yes, it is improvisational comedy stylings which are occasionally cringeworthy, but it's also the culmination of a lot of long-term storytelling. And it's kind of an opportunity to draw to a close a lot of stories, gather together all of the characters from the last few years of NXT, get them in one ring for one event, celebrate the life of NXT 1.0 before we move on to its death. Begin that episode with the wedding and end it with what turns out to be NXT's funeral. All out war in the six pack challenge. Bodies flying everywhere and everything is destroyed. The announce table is taken out. The barricades are destroyed. The ring mats are ripped up. The ring Canvas is ripped up, bodies destroyed, fans have to be moved back by officials, the announcers are evacuated from ringside, leaving the action happening without commentary, harking back to the original carnage of the Nexus invasion of Raw from 2010. The big video screen over the stage, a group of old NXT legends bring it down onto themselves and carry and cross. The entrance falls and erupts into explosions, sparks, Mass casualties, unconscious bodies everywhere in the wreckage as NXT goes off the air. Karrion Cross is hospitalized. We don't know when we're gonna see him again and Shawn Michaels releases a statement. NXT as we knew it, NXT as it became this unstoppable juggernaut bitch was destroyed. NXT needs to rebuild. In two weeks time, we'll be launching a new NXT. An NXT not of the past, an NXT not even of the present, an NXT of the future. And the logo is predominantly white. There's a trim of gold, but there's no black anywhere. Like Shawn Michaels came out in all white at WrestleMania 25 to combat the darkness of The Undertaker, the primary color of NXT 2.0 is bright, shining white. A cleansing of the darkness, a big bang out of the black. Bright, cheerful, but ultimately not like someone skittle bathed on a canvas. The next episode of NXT, the final one before NXT 2.0 is essentially a clips episode, a potted history of NXT up until this point. It's best moments, it's best matches with talking heads from the current main event scene talking about their one primary focus with the relaunch. NXT is starting afresh, forcing the current stars to think what one thing do they value the most? Johnny Gargano looks within himself, or more accurately within his wife, and answers family. Kyle O'Reilly says honor. Timothy Thatcher says respect. Pete Dunne says pain. Cameron Grimes says good times forever, yee-haw to the moon. And Tommaso Ciampa simply says Goldie and gets up and throws his chair like he always does. Also announced for that show is a night of champions. Every single championship in NXT will be defended. Raquel Gonzalez defending her NXT championship against Frankie Monet. MSK against Hit Rose, Ashante Adonis and Top Dollar. Shirai and Stark against Kaylee Ray and Ember Moon. Will they coexist? Kushida defending the Cruiserweight belt against Roddy Strong. Isaiah Swerve Scott and Drake Maverick having a ladder match to determine the one true North American champion. All these things are advertised for NXT 
2.0. It'll be a statement night for NXT. These are the champions with one big question mark. What is the future of the NXT Championship? So begins the first episode of the new NXT. Like NXT began in 2012 with Jim Ross and Dusty Rhodes, NXT 2.0. Also, quick thing, right? No, 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 I have to say it. Quick thing, this is like NXT 4.0 at least. Because you know they had the first NXT, then the, a series in 2011 called NXT Redemption. So no, it does matter, that's a reboot too. Then the hard reboot again in 2012, the Capital Wrestling Center, that is a, that's an NXT era almost. No, I won't move on. This matters. This matters. Where, where, no, you let go of me. Where, where are you throwing me? So the new NXT begins with Shawn Michaels standing in the ring, holding the NXT Championship. Behind him are 20 up and coming new faces. The kind of people you saw in the breakout tournament. Guys like Carmelo Hayes, Odyssey Jones, Rick Steiner's son, who is not called Bron Breaker. Call him, oh, I don't know. Bronson Steiner? Von Wagner, call him Cal Beverly because his dad's legitimately one of the Beverly brothers. Like NXT is all about the new generation. Why not openly celebrate the fact you've got second generation talent on your f***ing bucks? It doesn't, uh, this table's too heavy. Oh, it's not too heavy to flip. I actually can flip it. I won't though. I won't, ooh, I almost broke the studio. HBK explains this is a new beginning for NXT. A beginning where the focus, sure, is gonna be bringing you the best wrestling each and every week, but also the NXT rebirth is coming from these guys, the people behind me, the next generation, because that's what NXT means. That's why we use those three letters, the new faces, the next big things, the next WrestleMania main eventers, and maybe even the next NXT champion. We need a new NXT champion. And I thought, sure, we could hold a match between the established top guys, but no, that's not what tonight's all about. What's more NXT than creating a level playing field where everyone can compete for the top prize on this brand? And now look, you watching at home, I know what you're thinking. And look, you'd be right. A tournament sure is the best way to crown a new champion. And I, I know, okay, I know. T tournaments are my favorite things to book. I book like, I don't know, 17 of them because they are the best way of introducing a bunch of new stories, getting over a bunch of new names, and giving fans a reason to invest in a bunch of matches with names they don't recognize. Matches that all matter in ways that other matches don't always matter. Tournaments are the best, but, but, I'm also aware that I've booked them over and over again. So if in your mind a tournament makes more sense, they do a tournament, but instead, How's this for a new idea? Shawn Michaels announces that for this new era of NXT, wins and losses should matter. Over the next month or so, old faces and new will be competing against each other. And the first wrestlers to get five total victories will get a chance to wrestle for the vacant NXT championship. All matches will count. Battle Royals, tag matches, they all go on your stats. The first two wrestlers or more, if it happens on the same episode of NXT, to get to five wins will compete in a match. The winner of that match will become NXT champion. And this harkens back to the first series of NXT way back in 2010, going right back to the source of this brand where they kept track of how many wins each rookie had in order to rank them. And that gives everyone on the roster a chance to have these long running stories. New Brock Lesnar types like Bronson Steiner. I can't call him Bron Breaker. I just can't. Why has your name got too many Ks in it? Guys like that can shock the fans with a bunch of wins. Tommaso Ciampa wins his first match against Pete Dunne, for example, but Dunne injures Ciampa's neck. And Ciampa then has to reckon with the dilemma. Do I push through? Do I keep fighting against the pain? Do I risk my career for this one shot, this one chance to win back Goldie, the title I never actually lost? 
All matches carry this tension. It's a race. Everyone rushing to be the first to five. And it creates so much more legitimacy for new faces rather than just injuring Kyle O'Reilly and forcing Von Wagner into his spot in a move that's guaranteed to just annoy NXT fans. Also, it's worth pointing out that unlike AEW ranking systems, this is just for the initial crowning of a new NXT champion, okay? You don't have to adhere to it forever because Jesus Christ, you're gonna back yourself into a corner like AEW constantly do. And Michaels also announces that the first match of the new NXT is gonna be a battle royal featuring these 20 guys behind him. Only one person can win. Only one person can get that head start that NXT should represent a first step in becoming a star of tomorrow. And that's the match that Bronson Steiner wins. That's the match that marks him out as a special talent to what? Not a confusing bit of booking where he beats LA Knight and LA Knight's beaten twice on the same show for, I, I don't, That is how the new NXT progresses until its first major show. It's championship divisions laid out on the first show with the champions defending their belts and then reasons to tune in each week to see who's racking up the most wins, who's on their way to being the first to five, culminating in a match at the next NXT Super Show, which you can call it TakeOver if you want, but I'd maybe call it something else. Tommaso Ciampa versus Bronson Steiner and yes, I would have Champa win. I think he's absolutely the smart play to have as champion, marking that bridge between old and new, guaranteed to have great matches. And also the him and Goldie love story could be so much more effective if it's given a slower build of a few months, make people really root for him. Whilst also getting over this new brick house in Steiner. After that, Karrion and Cross can return. And then you got that story in the bag as well. The man who not only destroyed the first NXT, but also destroyed Champa the first time they fought at In Your House. But now with the power of God, anime and Goldie on his side, Champa is finally able to slay the beast. And so NXT is rebooted with a general direction for its first month, maybe two months, less of a focus on indie names who made their bones outside the promotion, more of a focus on homegrown stars, a more developmental feel, but done in a way that feels a little less unnatural than how NXT 2.0 has already started. A big stipulation, an intention to use that stipulation to create about a dozen or so new characters. And we get to see how this Gold Rush style setup affects these characters, how they react. Do they have an intense, emotional, near underdog story like Champa? Do they have loads of white meat babyface upsets? Do they buddy up in a you help me win, I help you win kind of faction? Does it force new names to turn to the dark side? With the right booking, from this one moment, you can create a raft of recognizable new faces in just a few consistently booked months. It might not be as immediately showy as poaching an indie talent from another promotion, but hopefully this gives NXT its own identity as a developmental brand, whilst also, you know, <laughs> not cutting the legs out from every other major indie fed in the industry. And that is how I would book NXT 2.0. Do you disagree? What would you like to see NXT become in the coming months? Let us know in the comments. What else would you like to see me book on this show? Let us know in the comments. And make sure you like and share this video around if you enjoyed it and subscribe to Parts of Unknown for more very silly wrestling content. Jam that jam.